Kristen Rosella is the magic name for the moment. Uh, Kristen Rosella is part of Project Expedite Justice. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're doing global connections. Uh, Kristen is in uh, is in Singapore, and we're talking to her about a very special project, a set of uh, cases that Project Expedite uh, Justice has been doing. Welcome to the show, Kristen. Thank you, Jay. It's really nice to be here. Yeah, it's great what you're doing. Uh, you're doing, um, you know, war crimes. And I, I must say that it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to spend some time with anybody like Cynthia Tai, uh, the founder of Project Expedite Justice, um, who, is, uh, who, is, who has the, the vision, the horizon, the, the global view to attend to this. So you were an ordinary lawyer working for firms, um, and then you decided you, you wanted to go into, into war crimes. Can you talk it's about the transition? Sure. Yes. I'm out of law school. I went uh, to a big firm in Chicago because I went to law school um, at Chicago Kent. And then I um, realized that I wanted to change. So I moved to New York and uh, switched firms. Uh, always I was in litigation. So I was always doing complex and corporate litigations, which I did enjoy the work. But I realized at some point that I wanted to do something more and um, that I wasn't feeling completely fulfilled. So I made a big jump in my fifth year out of law school and just stopped completely, which I don't recommend to any young lawyers because that type of transition is very difficult if you do that way. But um, yeah, I made the jump, I switched, I, I quit uh, big firm and then I looked for what was next. I took a few months to think about what I was passionate about. I started working and volunteering for a women's rights organization in New York. And slowly I found my way back to law, back into litigation, which it turns out I, I love. And I found um, international criminal law and international human rights law and moved to an organization called International Justice Project, working with victims from the Darfur genocide and helping to them to apply uh, for civil party status before the International Criminal Court. Wow, I, you know what a journey, and it really sounds like you, you know, you you can't you can't go back. You've decided not to go back. You're going yes, forward. This is what you've got to do in life. No. Yep, this is true. There's no going back at this point. But I have to say, I do appreciate those years that I did at the firms. Um, it gave me a different perspective. It made me sure that I wanted to take this path, and it also uh, it gave me skills that I still use today. So uh, that's great. Well, you know, we admire you. I speak for a lot of people when I say that, Kristen, and we also we support you. We're with you. Uh, we Thank want you, you to do this. We you do it for not only yourself, not only Project Expedite Justice, not only the movement that you know seeks justice, international justice, but a lot of people out there who are happy that you're doing it because you're, you're making the world a better place and hopefully you can succeed over the long term more and more. But let's talk about the project Expedite Justice that, that you're working on right now. You have two pieces of litigation we should talk about. The first one in the United States and the second one in, in, uh, in France. Can you talk about the first one first? Yeah, sure, because it's sort of, it's the beginning of the story. It's also the beginning of Project Expedite Justice, and it's it's when Cynthia and I first met and, and decided to partner up. Um, it was about 2014, 2015, when the Southern District of New York, the um, AUSA, the Assistant Attorney General, they were investigating and prosecuting uh, BMP Paribas for violating sanctions U.S. sanctions in Cuba, Iran, and Sudan. And Cynthia had been contacted by some organizations and NGOs and communities to represent uh, survivors from the conflict in uh, making applications to the Department of Justice uh, for potential reparations and restitution in the case. And I was contacted by another NGO and put in touch with Cynthia uh, thankfully, because it led to all of Project Expedite Justice and a wonderful partnership. But I was put in touch with Cynthia to work on those applications and filing a brief to the Department of Justice for mechanisms to uh, to provide the reparations to the to the survivors. So yeah. what yeah. had happened is that in 2015, 
2015, the prosecution did not go to trial, but the bank pled guilty. And uh, when it pled guilty, it forfeited the about $9 billion worth of funds for violating the sanctions in the three countries. And the Department of Justice had tried to do the right thing and um, set up a fund to ensure that some of this uh, forfeited money went to the survivors from the conflicts. Unfortunately, the reason I say tried to do is because unfortunately in the end, Congress enacted legislation that sent the money elsewhere um, to the 9-11 fund. But that's, that's how we originally started. BNP, BNP is Banco National de Paris. Uh, Paribas, BNPP. Paribas. Mm -hmm. And they're, they operated out of, out of Paris. Their headquarters is in Paris, but they are a global company, a global bank. Uh, they are yeah. one of the biggest banks in the world. They are certainly the biggest bank out of France. Yes. Um, and they, uh, for, for many years, well, several years, they owned uh, First Hawaiian Bank right here in Honolulu and throughout the state of Hawaii. Um, the other thing is, uh, I'd, I'd like you to describe the theory of the case. How does a, a bank, this is a bank now, how do they get responsible for atrocities? Hmm. So the original case was not for atrocities. It was for violating sanctions, but the sanctions had been put in place by uh, President Clinton and, and, and President Bush um, because of the human rights violations that were occurring in Sudan at the time. So in the case, the prosecutor in the U.S. had looked at uh, what the bank was, the, the business that bank, the bank was doing in Sudan from um, at least 2002 until 2008. And at, in this prosecution, they did not necessarily look at the atrocities directly, but rather as sort of an underlying crime. But what they were focused on was the violation of the sanctions. And that's how everything came to light for us because obviously we're not financial crime lawyers, but we are um, human rights lawyers and, and international criminal law lawyers. And so when we were looking at what's called a statement of facts that was part of the plea agreement, we then realized the, the extent to which the bank had done business in Sudan and the key years that they had done business in Sudan were the years of the Darfur genocide. And that's when we, that's what caught our attention. And that's when we began to uh, dig deeper. The Department of Justice found that, that the bank had done something wrong leading to the sanctions. What, what did they think the bank had done wrong? What did they think the connection between the bank and the atrocities were? So they, um, Actually, the bank pled guilty, so they admitted to uh, a conspiracy between the French headquarters, so the Paris headquarters, its Swiss subsidiary, and a, a correspondent New York bank uh, that was also owned by BNP. And the conspiracy was that they were covering up the transactions that were on behalf of the government of Sudan uh, for or on behalf of sanctioned entities, those entities that had been sanctioned by the, specifically sanctioned by the US and others for um, being involved in human rights violations in Darfur, Sudan, which is a Western, the Western side of uh, the country of Sudan, which Sudan is in East Africa, just um, to give some, some perspective. Yeah, so, uh, and what you said that I'd like to explore is, uh, you said uh, that, um, that there was money that was forfeited. Mm -hmm. uh, and I recall uh, reading about this, that there was something in the order of $9 billion That's was correct, forfeited. Yeah. How, how did that money get to a place where it could be forfeited to the United States? So when the, uh, when the, the plea happened, it, the plea agreement included the the forfeiture of the funds. So the prosecutor knew and had access to lots of information about the business that the bank had been doing with the government of Sudan and on behalf of the government of Sudan. And I, I really believe the Department of Justice at the time in, in New York was trying to do the right thing. So they saw um, these connections to the atrocities and the level to which the bank was, was uh, conducting business and therefore 
when they were, I mean, I'm speculating here because I obviously was not with, I can't speak for the, the AUSA in New York, but that they were trying to ensure that some funds were available for the survivors in um, of, of the conflict, but that they also, you know, a lot of the 9 billion, it also went to the US government, which is a normal path for uh, forfeited funds, but the, the Department of Justice tried to set aside about three billion after all, you know, the state of New York and the federal government took their their share. Um, they tried to set aside three billion that was uh, going to be used for the survivors uh, for restitution, but that never happened. Were people who had been in Sudan, Sudan, and who had been injured or killed um, because of things that the Sudan government did. The Sudan government was a was an outlaw government and it had done all kinds of war, war criminal kinds of things. And the, I guess the bank in this case was somehow complicit because it was supporting the, Su, the Sudan government and funding them and doing business with them. Is that, is that how it all started? So in the beginning, it was just a violation of U.S. sanctions, so an embargo. The, the Department of Justice just said, OK, you've, you violated a U.S. embargo. You know, you have to, uh, you know, you have to pay, pay for, the, for those violations um, or we'll continue the, the prosecution. But exactly what you said, that's what we recognized. And so when the money was legislated, when the legislation was enacted by Congress and the money was sent elsewhere, um, Cynthia and I began looking at other avenues of justice, specifically to expose the uh, potential and alleged complicity of the bank in the atrocities, because we believed that the, the amount of business that was being done, um, for example, let, let, me go, let me give you some like, examples of what the bank was doing, and this is public because it's part of the statement of facts that was attached to the plea agreement in the original prosecution. So the bank was facilitating transactions with the three entities, its Swiss entity, New York entity, and, and um, with knowledge of, um, of, of headquarters. So that was the alleged conspiracy in the, um, the sanction, criminal sanctions case where the bank pled guilty to this, these transactions. So they facilitated transactions intentionally omitting any reference to Sudan or the sanctioned entities um, that were already on, a, let's say, a blacklist by the US. Um, they did that knowing about the uh, atrocities that were going on in Sudan at the time. So the government of Sudan had been uh, bombing civilians. The Janjaweed, I don't know if you remember the Janjaweed Jay, but the Janjaweed was very active in Sudan um, in attacking and burning villages in Darfur, looting, um, you know, there was sexual violence and other uh, other types of ex extreme and mass, you know, mass murder, mass rape, mass violence. And so the bank was acting in, in, in the criminal sanctions prosecution, the most money that was transacted was on behalf of the government of Sudan. So six billion dollars um, from at least 2002 to uh, 2008. And when you look at the details, that was um, a large, you know, really, let's say, really uh, important for the Sudanese economy. The bank also admitted in the U.S. case to being to uh, holding 50 percent of the foreign assets of the government of Sudan, and um, to acting as the de facto central bank, essentially. So they were playing. Not it, we're not just talking one or two transactions here. We're talking mass. Um, you know, banking facilitation, access to the U.S. market that was critical at a time when the Sudanese government wanted to purchase weapons and um, and have access to the U.S. dollar. And everyone knew the Sudanese government was doing this. It was not um, it was not a private um, unknown set of facts. Uh, it was in the newspapers for years, um, and the bank knew. And so I guess it was not hard to show that the bank had knowledge of what its client was doing in those years. That's true. You know, there were human rights reports, uh, widespread human rights reports. There were, um, in 2005, the International Criminal Court in The Hague had opened an investigation into um, the Darfur conflict. 
uh, it was widely reported on that you know civilians were being attacked and um, and 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 harmed and killed. Okay, so then you know, uh, uh, so you were telling me that the um, the Congress enacted um, a bill, and I guess it became law um, to take the money that was um, forfeited uh, mm -hmm. by BNP and uh, and put it uh, in the in the terrorist the terrorist fund instead of uh, providing any part of it um, to, to the the families and the individuals who had been harmed and killed and tortured and the like uh, in Sudan. And that was after uh, the money, the, the nine billion had, had been forfeited. So, I mean, didn't okay. they have rights that had ripened um, before that happened? Congress took away their rights to part of that money. Do I, am I right about that? Well, so it, it, we hadn't gotten that far. So it was right before the, the Department of Justice was about to act so that it was more in the planning stages and there was, let's say, a promise, but it wasn't, it, it had actually hadn't come to fruition yet. And so that was, um, that was the problem. And we did look at, you know, whether there were challenges we could make to that legislation, but it was just not a, a potentially successful avenue so that we had to look elsewhere. The United States, although it has a policy to discourage this kind of uh, atrocity, um, and al although it did penalize BNP to the tune of $9 billion, um, it did not go where at least uh, Project Expedite Justice would have liked to see it go and, and, and what you know, a lot of people would have liked to see. Uh, so the United States then and now, then by virtue of the passage of that bill um, and now uh, is not a good venue uh, to make these cases in favor of those who have been injured or killed or tortured. Uh, so you have to go elsewhere. Is that the idea? Well, I don't want to give up on the U.S. yet, that it's not a good venue. So I don't want to go that far. But it, let's say it's become a very challenging venue and a very expensive venue to litigate uh, human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you also spoke to my colleague, uh, Nina Mann, as well, about litigating human rights abuses from a, a tort or civil law uh, perspective or strategy. And so it, it's there's been some some jurisprudence in the U.S. that has made from the Supreme Court, which has made it very difficult. Um, and, but it's not impossible. And, and and us human rights lawyers, we're not ready to give up on the U.S. completely. There is a, um, a, a law firm and a lawyer who's very dedicated to a, bringing a, a case for torts on behalf of the Sudanese survivors. In, um, in the US. And so her litigation is happening in parallel to our litigation in France. I don't want you to give up. Nobody wants no. you to give up. <laughs> and, and, we, <laughs> and we would like this country to be a good venue for claims of this nature. I mean, that is our moral structure and um, that's what we need to do going forward. Hopefully we will do that going forward. So uh, let's talk about the second case, which is the case in France. So okay. at some point you decided you wanted to pursue these claims or claims like this uh, in the courts of France as opposed to other other countries. Why? Mm -hmm. So we, um, well, one obvious reason was that the bank was French. So from a jurisdictional uh, perspective, which means the, the power of the court to hear the case. Uh, so France became an obvious choice. We had examined the U.S. from a tort perspective as well, but the cost of the litigation was uh, very high. And also it would send, although we believe 100% in uh, civil strategies, so tort law strategies, um, it, it wouldn't have been a criminal case. And we also believed it was important. And in talking to our, our clients and the survivors, it was important to send a message of criminal accountability for financial institutions. And so the case in France is, is, what is the first against a, a bank, a French bank and a financial institution for a, a alleged complicity in um, atrocity crimes. So for torture, genocide, crimes against humanity. And also we are attached financial crimes to those, uh, those claims because we believe that they're, they're uh, you know, they're linked. You can't separate the two. Okay. And how does it work in France? 
Yes. Okay. So it's very different in France. This is one thing I learned in, in living in Cambodia, which is also a civil law system based on the French system. So in the US, we have a common law system, which is an adversarial system. In France, they have a civil law system, which is an inquisitorial system, meaning that the court has a lot more power to do and conduct investigations. That's the biggest difference, I think, to me as a common law lawyer, where in the US, we as parties, prosecutor defense or plaintiff defense, you conduct your own uh, investigation. In France, uh, you, you can submit a complaint as a, um, as a victim or a survivor. And then if your case is, if the investigation is opened, an investigating judge takes over and he or she will conduct a full um, objective investigation, looking at both inculpatory and exculpatory evidence. So what claims did you make in that, in that forum and how far have you gotten? So we filed a complaint last September, September 2019, um, on behalf of nine Sudanese survivors and two um, NGOs, so two civil society organizations that have a special status in France to, um, to be civil parties. Oh, that's one other thing I should explain before the claims is that in France, the, good, the really a, a good thing about the system is that the, the victims they get a special status in court and they're actually parties to the litigation um, in a way that we don't have that at all in the US. And so it enables them to participate in the proceedings um, and have a voice, really have a voice in the proceedings. And that is very important for these types of crimes. So that was another consideration in looking at France is it enabled that, giving that voice to the, the survivors. So looking back at the claims, the question about the claims is that we alleged complicity in uh, torture, crimes against humanity and genocide. Uh, so that the bank was complicit in those crimes of the Sudanese government. So it's not that the bank necessarily committed crimes against humanity, uh, genocide and, and, and torture, but that they were complicit with what the Sudanese government was doing. Go into the French courts speak French, I'm sure they don't do it in English, um, and, um, and, and litigate, litigate uh, very, you know, difficult uh, uh, claims, claims that will be opposed, I'm sure, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, claims that um, involve um, a lot of damage, a lot of death, a lot of destruction. So query, um, you're not doing that alone. Uh, Project Expedite Justice must have um, or organizations uh, with which they are associated to go into the French courts and make these arguments. Am I right? Yes, you're right. And, and we have great, a great partner, uh, FIDH, of the International Federation for Human Rights, and also uh, Ligue des Droits de l'Homme, which is LDH. And both of those are, are civil society organizations that assisted and, and really led the charge in putting together the complaints and the, the, um, the strategy al alongside uh, us. And we also received support from pro bono law firm in, in, uh, in France, as well as uh, two Sudanese civil society organizations. So it, it was a group effort as these cases have to be and, and should be. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a global issue. It's not yes. limited to the individuals or even the country, and certainly not one bank, because other banks, invariably other banks do the same thing in, in this mm. world. We have to stop them. Uh, so the question, the question is, uh, what's the path from here? What's the result you're seeking? When will you know whether you have achieved that result? So we just found out recently, which was very good news, that the... Um, an investigation had been opened in France. And so now we'll be looking at the, the next steps, which will be um, you know, participating in the proceedings, looking at different investigative avenues and seeing uh, what the judicial authorities, how they proceed. So we're still at the very early stages. We, um, we, but this is a big step. I mean, we want, it took one year for the court to review the filing, the, which is the complaint and the attachments and the evidence that was submitted. And then uh, the, I, I do think also COVID delayed uh, everything a little bit, but uh, we're, we're very happy 
that you know one year later we're here and the, the investigation has been opened and we're proceeding forward but but this is the only the beginning there's still years to to come most likely evidence you submitted to the prosecutor was evidence that you project expedite justice had uh, had achieved accomplished uh, gathered over the course of your investigation uh, and i suppose that taken together with the evidence that the prosecutor himself or herself uh, gathers now um, that would all be a one body of evidence presented to the court am i right yes yeah, so the the um the we presented evidence attached to the complaint also open source evidence which is evidence collected uh you know online um previous civil society reports ngo reports um uh you know, the, the complaint was filed on behalf of nine Sudanese survivors and they provided their stories uh, as well. And um, now the, the investigating judge will take a look at the case and that, that will determine the next steps in the investigation. So he or she will lead this, um, this investigation going forward. You say evidence, you, you probably, I, I'm guessing you include affidavits, uh, interviews, maybe depositions um, of, of, of live testimony from people who were injured or tortured? So not, uh, yes and no. The French system is a bit different than the U.S. system. So at this stage, um, that has not happened yet. There's preliminary, let's say preliminary interviews and obviously our, our interviews with our clients, but um, the the court will really take take charge of the let's say official interviews, and the, the judge will interview uh, victims, witnesses, and and um, proceed from there. Um, you know, um, this, this must be a, a case that is being watched. This must be a case that is being watched in Europe. It, is must, it must be a case that is being watched by NGOs and, so, and human rights organizations around the world. Uh, and, it, and I'm guessing, but uh, I expect it would have an effect on other cases that, that could be brought, other cases in the pipeline, depending on the result you're able to achieve. Am I right on that? Yes, absolutely. And we hope so. We hope that it's being watched because we hope to send a message to um, financial institutions that you need to be watching you know where the money is going that 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 profiting from these atrocities is wrong um and you can be held accountable so we definitely are looking at uh, you know novel legal arguments here legal arguments that may affect other um you know banks and financial institutions and the way that they conduct business and and we we want to change the way business is being done um you know profiting more Atrocities don't happen in a vacuum. They um, they happen together with a very large network of supporters, enablers, um, different motivations, and so you can't just stop the direct, let's say, the direct perpetrator uh, who's committing the crime. If we continue to just focus on on that direct perpetrator and not the larger network that is supporting that direct perpetrator, we'll just keep be keep circling and circling around uh, trying to, to end, um, you know, end atrocities. It's yeah. really that supporting network that has to be examined. And, and that's what Project Expedite Justice and, and where Cynthia's vision is, um, is excellent, is that we, we look at a wider network. Uh, Cynthia and I understood from the beginning, and I think, uh, you know, our teams understand that this is important that, you know, looking at financial crimes alongside atrocity, crimes has a lot, a lot of advantages as well because financial crimes, you know, they have a paper trail that can corroborate victim and witness testimony. They can reveal evidence about the wider network. The paper trail can reveal evidence about the wider network. It can explain, you know, different actors and provide a, a different type of evidence that may otherwise not be gathered. So that's why we decided to file this case for the alleged complicity in the atrocity crimes, but also the financial crimes of money laundering and, and in France they call um, concealment. What it is money laundering nevertheless. Yeah, I just, uh, one other uh, thing about that is that, so you and Cynthia are, are uh, Cynthia lives here, she's a lawyer, 
here mm -hmm. in the Big Island, a, a fabulous woman, um, and you're in Singapore. How, how do you participate? What is your role in a proceeding, which is undoubtedly a serious proceeding involving a number of you know, judicial players uh, in Paris? How do, you, how do you participate in that? So we um, we have a, uh, an amazing French lawyer on our team as well, Laura Lou Moreau, and she worked extremely hard on uh, assisting and putting the complaint together. She works for Project Ex Expedite Justice as well, and um, she's based in France. We also, our partners were terrific, uh, and we work very closely with them. Cynthia and I have become masters of technology as well and masters of the virtual office, so uh, that, that works to our advantage. Strikes me that this isn't the last case you're going to do. And there are other cases. Well, let me ask you, are there other cases in the pipeline uh, that will follow? You know, we um, we hope that this is not the only case that we will do. And we are constantly examining and um, watching, you know, the news and the actions that are reported about the banks. For example, the large uh, leak that just occurred about the FinCEN files. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, from the, I think it's called the International um, Consortium of Journalists, and they published a, a leak of uh, FinCEN, which is the regulatory body in the U.S. for um, it keeps track of you know what's called suspicious transaction reports or suspicious action reports filed by banks, and so that was very revealing in some of the actions that banks are 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 not um, let's say. They're filing reports, but not fully taking action on certain suspicious transactions that they think maybe money laundering may be connected to to other types of crimes. And so this is something that we watch we watch closely. But as of now, we, we don't have anything in the pipeline yet, but we're always uh, watching. OK, well, we'll have to talk to you again about these things. <laughs> That's very clear. Now, we have a question. Um, that I, 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 I really need to put to you before we're, we're done here. Okay. Um, and it is this question, this came from a viewer. Has the Trump administration uh, affected your fight for human rights in any way? The policies mm -hmm. of the Trump administration and the various people involved in the Trump administration. And I suppose I would add my own, you know, uh, my sub question to that is, uh, Will, will it be, would it be better under the Biden administration? So the Trump administration has certainly made uh, litigating human rights and, and I think human rights in general, human rights work in general more difficult. He's also um, made the amount of work that we need to do has increased significantly uh, with the Trump administration. But, and we hope that with a change of administration, uh, this would improve. You know, but the U.S. has always been a little bit hesitant to participate fully with the international legal uh, bodies like the International Criminal Court. They've in the past supported from afar. Under Trump, they support not at all. Um, we hope under Biden that uh, perhaps lessons learned from Trump, the administration will um, see an opportunity for the U.S. to become more of a player in international human rights and international criminal law. And one of the ways that they could do that is by actually, you know, signing some of the treaties and conventions that would also make the U.S., um, you know, would, would provide, you know, for example, the International Criminal Court jurisdiction over U.S. actions. So we would really like to see that going forward. And, and I hope that, um, you know, if there's a change of administration, we can look back and see the reasons that we need to be uh, part of, of these these bodies. Yes. Uh, Kristen Rosella, member of Project Expedite Justice, involved in very important things uh, uh, and, and upholding standards of international morality. Uh, thank you so much, Kristen. I hope we get a chance to talk to you again soon. Thank you, Jay. It was a pleasure. Aloha.